Uh, so today we have a great presentation lined up for you, one that I'm personally really excited to um, see. Uh, be a superhero on day one with abp.io. Um, very excited to see this presentation by Lee Richardson. Lee Richardson is a prolific writer, speaker, and video producer on .NET and open source topics. He has published over 100 posts to his blog at leerichardson.com that have been received uh, with more than um, half a million views since 2007. Very impressive. He has published over 100 posts to his, oh, I already mentioned that, his uh, Code Hour YouTube channel that's at youtube.com slash leerichardson200 has uh, attracted over 1,000 subscribers who have collectively consumed over 7,000 hours of his content. Stack Overflow ranks him as a two percent contributor. I don't know how you find Tom. Lee. That's incredible. <laughs> so. um, wow, well, you must have like everything unlocked with that kind of participation. I, I keep trying to get like one more thing unlocked on Stack Overflow. I've got like <laughs> that's very impressive, sir. It's, um, it's funny. I've been there like ten years now, and uh, you know, Wiki, with Wiki, when you're on Wikipedia, you can edit a page on day day one, basically, as anonymous yeah. user. But like, I only just within the last six months uh, unlocked the ability to edit a page. I just thought it was funny. Like, oh, are you serious? Oh, yeah. wow! And you have to be a top two percent contributor to do that. That's insane. Okay, that's well. I'm glad you got there. <laughs> I'm only about twenty years behind you. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so Lee has published uh, 25 articles to code uh, project with an average uh, article rating of 4.96 out of 5. Uh, throughout his 20 year software development consulting career in the DC area, he has spoken to scores of times at code camps, conferences, and user groups like ours. And thank you for doing one more. Um, he has created the siren of shame.com, uh, is a solution samurai at Inferno Red. And um, when not coding, he enjoys running, mountain biking, smoking, biscuits, electronics, 3D printing, and woodworking. Uh, he, is an act, uh, he is active on Twitter, where you can reach him at LP Richard. All right, Lee, uh, thank you so much again for joining us to present uh, today. I'll let you take it away. Awesome. Thank you for the warm welcome. All right. So hopefully you are all here to learn about how to be a hero on day one of uh, your next ASP.NET project. I'm going to break this down into four main areas. First, to just a quick overview of what it is, and then I'm going to get into the benefits and talk about what you're going to get out of it. And hopefully I will convince you in that section to stay awake for the rest of the presentation. I'm going to get into the main area is the foundational features. Those are all the things that you're getting out of the box with it. I'll give a demo during that section of how to just create a site from scratch. And then the last section, the how-tos, I'm going to show you how to create a CRUD page in it. So without further ado, let's talk about what it is. So this is my personal definition, and you won't find this on their side, but I, I like this. It's first of all, a one-time code generator. It generates a backend in ASP.NET Core, and it generates one of three different front ends, either Angular, ASP.NET Core MVC, or Blazor. So that's cool. It is also a framework. And that part of it lives in NuGet, or if you have the Angular front end, it lives in NPM. And I think it's important to distinguish these two primary parts of what it is, because the, the one-time the co one code generator gets you the ability to customize your site and make it how it is, you know, how it needs to be for your customer. The framework side of it gives you the ability to pull down updates and have them ship new features and new functionality and, and bug fixes. It's for new projects. If you have an existing project, it will not work. It is only, and that's because of that one-time code generator element. So hopefully I don't lose half my audience, but important to identify that up front. It gives you an end-to-end -end working site, 100% working site, right out of the box, a bunch of foundational features, which I'll get into later, and the best practices. So just to give you a little bit of history about what this thing is, it used to be called ASP.NET Boilerplate. I'm just out of curiosity, has anyone heard of ASP.NET Boilerplate? Yeah. One hand? Two? Cool. So... This presentation is primarily assuming that you don't know the, the background, but I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, comparison. So the terms that it used to use were ASP.NET Boilerplate, which is the free open source section of it, and ASP.NET Zero, which was the paid version. The new terms in the new world are ABP Framework is the free open source one, and ABP Commercial is the one that you pay for it. Taken together, those two things are ABP.io. It took me a lot of work to, to just 
it's just a quick, um, like almost unimportant slide, but it took me a while to figure out those terms and what they all mean. So why did they need to upgrade? The original ASP.NET boilerplate was released in 2013, which was before even Angular 2. And so in 2019 was when they came out with the ABP.io and they released it in .NET 5 in .NET Core, uh, when .NET Core 3 was released. And that was uh, Halil Ibrahim had a session right after the keynote actually where he announced this and he was the lead developer on it. So why did they need a new one? The answer is because it's a mature technology when it's been released like eight years ago or whatever, but it also had a lot of history sort of things that get dragged along. So for instance, for dependency injection, the ASP.NET boilerplate uses Castle Windsor. Is anyone familiar with Castle Windsor for dependency injection? Does anyone like Castle Windsor for dependency injection? Good. You won't be upset when I tell you it's absolutely trash. So uh, they, when they released uh, ABP.io, it uses the .NET Core 3 frameworks for dependency injection, for logging, and a bunch of other things. So it's a much more modern stack. You still have the choice, if you're starting a new project, of doing ASP.NET boilerplate. Um, I asked him, I asked Halil, uh, what's the end-of-life plan? ASP.NET boilerplate if you wanted to. Is there a question? I thought you broke up for... for about 10 seconds. Yep. Oh, no. Uh, what was the last thing you heard? You asked um, somebody a question. On the uh, the um, end of life for it, and we didn't get an answer. He had to oh. do with the end of life for Sorry, say it again, Tom. I was going to say I think it had to do with the end of life plan for ASP. Uh, uh, okay, yeah. So the end of life plan. So I asked Hilliel, the, the founder, about the end of life plan, and he said that there is no end of life plan. And that was a while ago, and it's still the case today. There is no end of life plan. You could choose a new project with ASP.NET Boilerplate if you wanted to. It is a mature platform, and I have used, I've built two projects based on it. It's a great platform. Um, but ABP.io is now over a year old. It's mature. I think it's time to, to choose that. There's a migration guide that will probably not apply to any of you. So let's talk about it being open source. This is ABP.io. It already has, after a year, it already has 4.9 thousand stars on GitHub. So it's a popular framework. And I found that remarkable. By comparison, ASP.NET Boilerplate has 9,000 stars on GitHub. And if you go take a look at the downloads for it on NuGet, it has over a million downloads. So it's a popular framework. If you haven't heard of it, I don't know why it's not. It's, it's funny. It seems like it's really popular, but a lot of people haven't heard of it. It's a great framework. Though. I'm going to talk a little bit about ABP Commercial. I'm not trying to sell you. I don't care whether you, you know, if you're starting a project, whether you buy it or not, but I think it's important to understand whether you, whether, if you go for the free one, what you're not getting out of the box. It's just useful to, to know. And so there are UI themes. There's obviously support um, and modules. So modules are really cool. It's a cool feature that they have in there. All of the backend code is broken out into these functions called modules. And if you want a piece of functionality, you can put a dependency on that with an attribute on your project and you get a life cycle with each one of those modules. It has a startup, a shutdown life cycle, and they provide, you can actually build your own modules, but they provide a bunch of modules out of the box. You get additional modules when you go commercial. These are the themes. You can see they're, they're pretty, they're prettier than the one that comes in the free box, I guess. Um, but they're all kind of the same, it's different colors. There are community themes out there as well that are free. The ABP suite makes the generation of CRUD considerably easier. You just go through this form. I don't have a copy of ABP commercial, but just looking at it, it looks like it would save some time. That would be nice. And I talked about modules. Okay, so there, uh, you get identity server integration with the free one, but there's identity server, like a special UI that you get. You get audit logging, but you get a special UI if you pay for it. Um, there's SMS integration, whatever. None of that's that important, but... Um, if we dig into some of these, like the account management, so you get login, you get registration, multi-tenancy user lockout, forgot password and social login, all of that out of the box. You get two-factor authentication, email, uh, SMS verification, profile pictures, blah, 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 if you pay for it, whatever. So that just gives you a sense of the paid versus the free version. The rest of the entire rest of the presentation will just be on the free version. So let's talk benefits. I'm going to break this down into what you're going to see, what you're going to get out of the box on day one, what you're going to get out of week one, what you're going to get out of month one. This is what the site looks like right out of the box. I will be demoing this in a little bit. So you get identity management, you can edit roles and users and tenants. That's a good start for being able to, uh, for, for virtually nothing. This is what it looks like to edit the admin. So the day one benefits, right out of the box, you're up to speed fast. You've got a fully end-to-end -end working site with a bunch of best practices. So that's 
that's pretty strong. At the end of the first week, though, I think you probably would have uh, no difficulty creating some relatively sophisticated crud, and then you can bring that back to your boss immediately. And presumably, boss will be deeply impressed. And you know, you could say, um, you know, I found this great framework, and I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Or if you wanted to, you could just take all of that, uh, all of that glory, and bathe in it, and just you know, be like, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty awesome. I think, uh, I think that would be a pretty big benefit right there at the end of the first week. So week one, week one benefits, getting all these foundational features, the pre-implemented best practices. There's a domain-driven design architecture. So the architecture that it's giving you out of the box is an enterprise-grade architecture. It's designed not necessarily, it's not like, it's the opposite of a Ruby on Rails kind of a project. It's not designed to get you um, up in coding, you know, prototype super fast. It's really designed to be um, mature, scalable, something that's going to live in enterprise. It's also well documented. The documentation is really good. And I think you'll come to appreciate that if you were to, to go take a look at it uh, at the end of the first week. At the end of the first month, or maybe a couple months, this is a site, one of my sites that I built on ASP.NET Boilerplate. Customer has been very happy with it. And so, you know, you're getting that upper grade architecture and you don't realize that. So I talked about documentation from an individual perspective, but if you adopt this on your project or you adopt this in your organization, your enterprise, you can have people move in and out. And at the company I work for, my, my day job, I work at Inferno Red, or consulting company, and they have used ASP.NET Boilerplate on a number of different projects. And we have a lot of, even though everybody customizes the site and takes it in their own custom direction for what their customer needs, there's still a lot of base functionality that's common between all of the projects. And that's a benefit that you were to get if you were to adopt it enterprise consistency. All right. You ready to stay awake for the rest of the presentation? Did I convince you this is worth, uh, worth paying attention to? Yeah, some, some yeses. Ready roll. All right, awesome. I'm going to talk about the foundation of features from four different areas. I'm talking about the front end, the back end, deployment, and testing. I talked about the three different front ends, the Angular, and you see, and Blazor. So it's a little bit hard to talk about the benefits, or sorry, the features that you're getting across all three of those because they're all slightly different. So I'm going to sort of weave in and out and hopefully everyone will get something out of this. So this is MVC, it's been a, uh, MVC, these tag helpers that they give you. So if you do an ABP input, it's a tag helper that will then use reflection to look inside of your model and it will render appropriately for the data type and the uh, annotation attributes, the attribute annotations which are put on it. So in this case, it figured out that name should be, it's because it's a string, put in a text box because it's required, it put in a required field. Uh, this has a data type of password, so this put input type equals password. This is a bool, so it rendered as a checkbox. So it's kind of nice, take a little bit of work. Or if you just want to skip all of that, then you can use ABP dynamic form and it will generate all of that. And if you want to go in and customize it, you can always back it back out. So that's kind of nice. Here is an Angular we have also got data tables with sorting, filtering, and pagination. Those that sorting, sorting, filtering, and pagination is built throughout the entire thing, which is, which is really nice to get that kind of thing right out of the box. And this data table over on the left hand side, it does a lot of that for you. There's also a lot of sort of just like little miscellaneous things. There's a confirmation dialog modal that pops up, and there are um, toasts. You can a toast, send in toasts. All these are plugins that. You know, they're not too hard. Like all of these things aren't too add, hard to add, but when you get it all out of the box, just configured, it's it's really nice. You said plugin, so is it something you have to download additional, or is it just? If you were doing a project from scratch, sure, you would need a, a JavaScript plugin for toasting. Are you saying it's included in um, ABP or? Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah, it is included in ABP. If you were not to do ABP, then that's something that you would need to include in your JavaScript plugins. And in ABP, is it, um, you said it's a plugin in ABP too, right? Or is it, no, it's just purely included? This particular one comes out of the box. Gotcha. Nice. Yeah. And they probably, I haven't even ever needed to look into it, but I'm sure they don't, they didn't build it themselves. They probably plug into some Toast or JavaScript library. In fact, if you go in and look at the, if you have an Angular site and you go take a look in the um, packages.json file, it's a pretty big list. So they do. They do include a lot of things, and you can swap them out if you need to. It includes localization included by default everywhere. So if you take a look inside of the back end, you'll see that there's all these .json files for each language. And you can very easily, if you're an Angular, this is what the Angular world looks like. I'm, I'm more of an Angular person, so I apologize if this is a little bit heavier on the Angular. But this is how you would include localization. You say, I want the menu products, and then it 
automatically goes and picks that up, which is nice. Also, you can even do parameters. So you can say, are you sure you want to delete? And then you can put in, where is it? Oh, message localization params product name. And so then it, it goes in and includes the product name in the, where you put the squiggle zero there. From front end perspective, security, they have, actually, so, well, I don't know, is now a good time to do a, to a demo? Have I, have I shown enough slides? Have I, Go download this thing and kind of give you a sense of how it works. I'll take a demo anytime. <laughs> All right, sounds good. We'll do it. So to get started, you need to do a. Let's see. I'm gonna pull up my notes over here. So th they have all this document, but it's a .NET uh, tool install minus g and it's volo dot abp dot cli. And oh man, you can't see that, can you? Well, it says it's already installed. So once you get that, then you can start doing ABP commands. You don't have to do this at the command line if you don't want to. If you want to, you can go over to abp.io and they have a cool there it is. They have a cool like website that you can generate. You put in your project name and what type you want and maybe see a parameter. And you can click create now and it generates a zip file and you just download the zip file. So that's pretty cool. They really do make it easy. Uh, I'm gonna do it from the command line just because I don't know, it's new, it's cool. So to do that, we're going to do ABP, and I think it's going to be new. Yes, and we're going to call this Lee's Store 3, because I've already done a couple of these practice demos. And uh, front end, you can see minus U. Actually, let's do ABP. That helps you can see what the options are. So here's some examples. Store 3, and our front end is going to be Angular, if you don't mind. Actually, I'm just out of curiosity. How many, um, what, are, what, are, what kind of front ends do you guys build? Show hands. Who are something, however you do it. <laughs> who all does uh, Angular here? Who, who would use Angular on a new project too? Who all would use uh, Blazor on a new project? <laughs> I like that enthusiasm tech. Uh, that's one, two, three. Okay. Oh, that says, uh, um, how about React? One, two, three, React. Okay. Um, uh, there used to be, uh, there is a React on ASP.NET Boilerplate. They do not have React front end on abp.io. I assume that it's in the works because that's something that people like. Um, and Vue too. Actually, how many how many Vue fans? Who would use it? Vue on a new project? One, maybe? Oh, okay. Um, I'd like to learn more about it, but I haven't had a chance. I've heard wonderful things about Vue. I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping someone will force me to start a new project on Vue at some point. <laughs> yeah. Angular uh, and MVC, ASP.NET MVC. And, and, yeah, and ASP.NET MVC. Well, I'll show fans for ASP.NET MVC. Yeah. Really? Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Well, it looks like I'm not going too far off the ways rails by choosing Angular. So uh, notice this. This is a mobile front end. They actually have a mobile app that you can generate with React Native. So that's cool. I will not do that today. And they have MongoDB support. This is one of the new features in app.io. If you want Mongo, you've got that option. I'm going to use Entity Framework. And let's see. You can, yeah, all the rest of that will bother with. And then the uh, connection string. And uh, this connection string, you don't have to specify it here. You can go back in and modify all the app settings.json files, but this there's two separate ones that gets that, that get up that exist that are important and this sets them both, which is nice. So we'll do server equals and um, three. First connection is true. Oh crap. Wait. It's a, this is a common mistake. It's a, it's, you need to put the, put this into a folder. The folder that you're in is where it gets generated. Let's try that again. So this is going to create two separate folders. One of them is the Angular folder. One of them is ASP.NET Core folder. I'm going to go in here and open this with Visual Studio Code. And I'm going to start downloading the internet because that's going to take a long time. Uh, they, they used to use NPM and Yarn, and you could choose either one, and they got rid of the NPM, and ABP.io just uses Yarn. Out of curiosity, does, uh, does anyone have any preferences in Yarn versus NPM? We used to use NPM, then went to Yarn, then went back to NPM. <laughs> after they fixed all of their locking stuff. I've heard other people say that. Well, this is Yarn. 
Well, I like yarn. So, it's definitely a little faster. Seems like it's a little fat, or it seemed like it was faster for a while, and I thought maybe I'm caught up. Maybe. I don't know what's really going on. So. I think it depends on Jackson. I'm not using Chocolate Winter. I'll let you download it. Do you have time for a quick question? Yeah. Uh, are there any plans to support uh, .NET Core uh, with any of the future versions of uh, uh, ADP? Because I just tried to download it, and apparently I'm, I'm, I'm too far ahead. I'm using .NET Core app 3.1, and it says, like, nope, can't do it. You're probably too far behind. It's on .NET 5, .NET Core 5. Oh, okay. <laughs> what version are you using? Are you on 6 already, Ron? Yeah, well, maybe I haven't updated it. Because, yeah, it says not, not that 5.0. Okay, well, Rod, if you're in the future, you have to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Rod's like, man, you guys got to stop using this old version 5 technology that just came out. Yeah, uh, I went to the site and did the uh, the thing that he showed where it generates it, and it said 5.0, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, that that core, 5.0. I'll tell you how I know it's 5.0, because I recorded this for my YouTube, for a YouTube channel, and when I did... That, like I'd, I'd run through a demo two days prior and when I was in the process of recording it, they had just pushed the update and they hadn't even announced it on Twitter yet. And I went to go download it and, it's, and it failed while I was trying to record and I was like, oh, what's going on? It took me a long time to figure that out. So hopefully I just saved you a little bit of time. Like, like, like I said, it's frustrating. It's frustrating to have two developer machines and they're not completely in sync with each other. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was on that, I that five. So. Sorry. I'm going to give a quick overview of the project. This is the ASP.NET Core MVC project. is the HTTP API dot host. So nine, yeah, nine times out of ten, you're going to set that as the startup project. I don't know if you guys do that shortcut, by the way, or if you're even Visual Studio using this if you're Mac users. But um, I like to right click and then I just hit the A button because I'm always setting the default project back and forth so frequently. Just a little, little shortcut for you there. So this is the most important project, but you're not going to go into it very often. If you're adding new controllers, you would add the controllers into HTTP API. They have an HTTPAPI.client, which is new and super cool. This is the ability to define an API via controllers that's not for your spa. It's not for your, your you know, UI front end. This is for a customer or maybe a command line app or something else entirely. I haven't used this, but it looks really cool. And I actually have a YouTube uh, video on how to do this. And I have two YouTube videos on how to do this in ASP.NET Core or um, in ASP.NET Boilerplate. And they just implemented that in ABP.I. This is the next most important thing. The application project is where the entry points generally are going to go, especially for your UI. So inside of application are these things called application services. They are very important. They are like controllers, but in this sort of DDD world that ABP has created, they will give you all of your CRUD and your security and your logging and your validation. If you if you put your application service into there, it'll create all of that for you. All of the features that you, I'm going to show you that are cool, they come when you primarily when you use app services. So this is where your entry point is. Inside of your contracts is where you're going to put your data transfer objects and emails. Your database migrator is where all of the migrations live. The domain is where all of your entities are generally going to live. Shared is where you can put interfaces and Entity Framework Core is where, if you're using Entity Framework, your data context lives. And I'll get all to, into all of this in the second demo a little bit more. So I'm just giving you a quick overview. Um, oh, sorry, I said it wrong. This is where your data, mi data migrations are in Entity Framework Core, that DB migrations. But this, the DB migrator, is a command line app. And this is really cool. This command line app allows you to run migrations, which you could do at the command line with um, update-database, or there's an EF, yeah, there's a .NET EF command as well. But if you use the command line app, you can compile that into an exe, and you can have your, uh, if you have a um, DevOps pipeline, you can compile that, put that into an asset in a stage of your uh, DevOps pipeline. And if you've got a multi-stage DevOps pipeline, then each subsequent stage can run that compiled uh, uh, tool and, it, and run it against your database. You give it administrative rights into your database, and then you can give less than administrative rights to your application. So that's uh, it's a really nice security feature, and it makes DevOps a lot easier. Also, if you're using multi-tenancy, I'll get into multi-tenancy a little bit later, but you can potentially have multiple databases. If you have one, you can have one database. You can have one database for all of your tenants, or you can set up to have a database per tenant, or you can have a mix and match. Like let's say you've got a couple different customers, like a couple customers you, you know, that are really small, no one's ever heard of. And then you've got like Microsoft as a customer, and they have high bandwidth requirement, or, or whatever. You can give them their own database, and then when you run, the, run it through the database migrator it will know to run it across all of the databases that you might have. So that's really nice. Also, one more feature that's new in ABP.io is you can have, you know, if you want to seed data in Entity Framework, 
normally you have to do that in a migration and you have to do it with um, insert commands, but they give you an option for running C sharp to seed your data. And if you do that and you put it in the right place then the DB migrator will run your C sharp based seeding, which is nice. So, okay, so that's just a quick overview of the project. I'm going to run the migrator here in just a second, just like I promised, but first let's create a database. tables in there and if I run this migrator I'm going to control f5 that because it should run a little faster with the control f5 claims it succeeded there we go okay so ABP gives you a lot of database tables as you might expect out of the box for all the security and whatnot they do so let's see if we can just let's see if we can run this I did another control f5 here and with any luck, this is going to start Swagger. So another thing they give you out of the box is they set up uh, Swashbuckle, and Swashbuckle generates a Swagger file for you. So this is a really nice thing. That, now that, you know, all these things are things you can set up yourself, but if you're starting a new project, you just get all out of the box, which is nice. So I could, for instance, go ask for all of the roles, try it out, execute this, and 401, unauthorized. Okay, uh, we can log in. We can... Try putting in, I think it's admin, password is like one, the default password is one, Q2, W, three, capital E, star, I think. Let's try that. Okay, 200, that's good. And now let's try to get all the roles. What was that? Uh, where am I? Roles. Sorry. I've got this. Oh, so much easier. I don't, so zoomed in. Okay, and let's execute get all roles again. Now we got a 200, and there we are. You can see that there are, there's one of them that came back. It's the admin role and you know, stuff. Anyway, we got stuff back. So that's cool. The back end is working. Now let's try to get the front end working. Hopefully, yarn has completed. Yes, it did. That's good. So I'm going to ng serve. Hey, Lee, I have a quick question. Yes, Keith. Um, so you said uh, this is primarily for, you know, starting new projects because it you know, generates a lot of the code for you. Um, my, my, I guess my question on that is, I understand that aspect of it. Um, what about, you know, creating a new project to point to an existing database? Is that an issue? Like, we'll just insert the ABP tables into the existing database? Because, I mean, obviously you're creating a, a database from scratch that has no tables. Is that an issue or is that fine to do? Or? I've done that before. Um... I've done that when I've had two databases. I kept it separate by having all of the ABP, ASP.NET boilerplate anyway, uh, in, a, in its own separate database. And then I had a separate order context with the, the legacy data and the legacy database. And yeah. it was kind of a pain to, to do it that way. I think if I do it again, I would probably try and keep it all in one database. And I think there should be no reason why you couldn't do it. I think it would work. Okay. I just I haven't done it, so I can't give you 100% yeah. confidence on the answer. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Okay, so hopefully we can local host 4200. Yeah, there we go. Great. Lisa 3 is successfully running. I think if I log in, it already knows I logged in as admin because I did that through Swagger. Uh, I can log out here so you can see the login screen. So check this out. Um, this is at 4200. And if I log in now, a little odd, right? I don't know. Do you find that odd? It switched from 4200 to 44399. I found that odd. ASP.NET Boilerplate didn't used to do that. Reason that it does this apparently is if you have the mobile app and you have the uh, Angular app and maybe you've got a few other apps, they all authenticate to the same place. They all authenticate on one page. This then gives you a, a token back, and then all of the clients have access to the token. So this is part of OAuth too. And I'm not a security expert, so I, I think this is part of the way identity server integration works, and it's a good thing. I found it a little bit annoying, but um, I think it's I think it's good. It's not supposed to be. Two W three capital E star. We're saving that here, so we can go in and we can see we've got users. Here is a user called admin, and we've got roles. And here is that one we were seeing the admin role. We can go in and edit the permissions, and I'll talk about all this later. But uh, that gives you a, just a sort of a quick overview uh, demo of what this is. Any questions before I get back to the slides? The, the login, I'm, I'm sure you'll talk about it some more, but um, this, uh, the authentication and whatnot, what, what providers work with it? Does it work with like Okta or Auth0 out of the box, or is that complicated to implement? Uh, I know a lot of people use 
either Octa or Auth0, I guess, those are the two popular ones. I wish I could answer that. I, I don't know. That would be yeah, it should be OAuth2. You know, is a pretty widely adopted standard, so you could use anything that's compatible with OAuth2 and do federation and everything else. Awesome. Thanks, Zach. Yeah, thank you, Zach. Okay, so that's OAuth2. They do support the security at the route Angular version of it. So if you, this used to be one giant routes page, and with ABP.io, they broke it out into modules. So each new entity that you add is its own module. And if you add an auth guard or a permission guard, which they add by default, the auth guard says you can't get to this route unless you are authenticated. And the permission guard says you can't get to this unless you own this permission, the least store dot view edit products or whatever. I'm going to get into permissions. This is a little bit more complicated. This is the way security works is a little bit more complicated. I won't get into that later, but there are these things called permissions. That's the way routing works. So multi-tenancy, are, are you all familiar with what what I mean when I say multi-tenancy, is it worth describing? Okay. Yes, yes, and mostly yes, one, maybe one now. So, uh, so okay, real quick, multi-tenancy is if you have like a bookstore, you know, and you're and you're selling books, that's a single tenant scenario, but but you get real popular and now you're, um, maybe you're um, got a whole bunch of bookstores and you've got bookstores all over the country and each one of those bookstores would have its own um, books, its own sales, its own employees, they basically, you, you might want to sell them, give them all the same site and use, but they all have different view into that, into that app. They only see their own data when they log in. And this is one of the features that ABP.io gives you out of the box. If you need to do multi-tenancy, ABP.io is, uh, kills it. It makes it life so much easier. They do a great job. I, I love this feature. I, I, I needed this on one of my projects that I used with ASP.NET Boilerplate. And then funnily enough, the first, the, the first customer didn't need it, but all of a sudden they're like, oh. Uh, we need to start white labeling this. This is becoming a popular product. And now we want to sell it to all these other people. And I was like, oh, this is fantastic. This is going to be so much easier because we chose ABP, ASP.NET Boilerplate. So the way it works is when, on that login page, you can choose your tenant. And I've got a whole video on uh, our YouTube channel about the way multi-tenancy works if you're interested in the details. But uh, just know that it's a great feature. It's well implemented. And this is roughly what it looks like. You can you can inherit from an iMulti tenant, and then you get this tenant ID, and then it will automatically only show you products that belong to whoever's currently logged in. It figures out who's currently logged in, it figures out which tenant they belong to, and it will by default only show products for the uh, that are appropriate to the user that's logged in. You don't have to do any filtering. If you insert a new product, it'll figure out who the tenant of the current user is and automatically populate this this GUID to the appropriate tenant value. So it's almost like you don't even have to think about multi-tenancy. It's awesome. If you don't need it, uh, just jump into the multi-tenancy consts and set is enabled to false. Auto-generated service proxies. I love this feature. Um, any uh, Anyone here use um, auto-generated auto proxies? Uh, this is, yes, Bruce, awesome. Yeah, so this, they used to use nswag. nswag was a great tool for generating all of your TypeScript objects, strongly typed TypeScript objects, and not and, and enums. And not just that, but it also, also generates all of the code to call into the back end. It, it looks in your Swagger file and says, OK, I've got a, an API endpoint called register. It takes a user DTO as an object, and it generates the code so that all you have to do is write like this dot product service dot get and when as soon as you type dot the um, IntelliSense pops up because dot get was generated uh, in product service dot ts and when you pass in a product you can new product and it'll automatically figure out what the properties are that you could type in and it's, it's all strongly typed and wonderful love this feature in abp.io they don't use nswag anymore they custom wrote the code themselves and put it into their cli tool so when you type abp generate dash proxy it will it, you have to have your backend running in swagger file available. It'll look in your Swagger file and it'll generate all of these files. Funny story here, nswag used to generate one giant file. So as your project gets bigger and bigger, the single file that it generates gets gigantic. You're talking like 100,000 lines of TypeScript code. And I would make changes to it. Sometimes new people would join on the project and we'd do a code review, you know, have a code review process. And you know, people would be like, Lee, I know you're a good developer. But have you considered using maybe smaller files? Uh, you know, hundred thousand line file seems like it's you know maybe maybe not the world's most uh, 
professional way of, of writing code. <laughs> that'd be like, yeah, 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 you have to understand this is code generated. And they're like, oh, right, right, right. Um, so with the new, with ABP.io, the code generation is broken down into individual files per entity, which is so much nicer. Better, it gets better until it sends out a physical, uh, Visual Studio code too. Okay, that's the front end. Oh, the fun stuff, the back end. So I'm gonna give you a quick overview and then I'm gonna delve into some of the details that Find are interesting. So I'm just going to give you a big block of code and kind of um, skim through the different parts of it. This is an application service. I talked about this a little bit earlier. This is like your entry point into the app for giving, uh, for, for providing, for instance, CRUD services or whatever. It, or you know, this is an increment quantity method. If you write an increment quantity method, it creates autom automatically creates a, a back an entry point in your API called increment quantity that takes an int and that gets generated in your Swagger file. So first of all, notice the that inherits from CRUD app service. So CRUD app service is what's giving you the create, read, update, delete, and get all methods by for free. And then anything you add, you can add to it. If you just inherit from the app service, then you don't get all of that. You just can write increment quantity. And that's the only thing which is exposed on this at this particular endpoint. Notice the dependency injection, constructor-based dependency injection that's already set up for you. I, I've been on a lot of projects that other people have started and they're like, I know that I should use dependency injection. I just never really got around to it. And, you know, and they end up writing a constructor and they just like knew a bunch of things into it to sort of give you a poor man's dependency injection. They're like, we'll get around to writing dependency injection, putting dependency injection in. Well, that's just one more thing that's done for you out of the box. That's really nice. The repository pattern. I have come to really like the repository pattern. It's wonderful for unit testing. It means that you're not putting in a whole, um, uh, entity framework object that you have to mark all the different things out. It's just exposing only the entities that you would need to have access to, to you. So I, I really do like the repository pattern. There's a declarative authorization up there. And I'll get into that in more details later. Validation happens automatically. So when someone passes in a product or a product DTO or whatever, it looks at the annotations that you put on that DTO and validates them. It doesn't even, it won't even get into any of these methods. The validation happens prior to it getting into your app service. Audit logging. There's logging, which happens quietly in the background. You can turn it off if you want, but it has a database table of every single um, call that goes into your application. So that's also a security from an auditing perspective, potentially if you have enterprise requirements for, for auditing. Logging is set up for you automatically. It used to use Log4Net, and now it uses the Microsoft logging uh, .core uh, thing. This is cool. You get unit of work, transaction, and connection management for free. So at the beginning of this method, a transaction is automatically started. At the end of it, the transaction is automatically committed. If any exceptions are thrown throughout the course of this lifetime here, then the transaction is rolled back. And then, uh, you know, if you do a whole bunch of different things to the database, they all get rolled back. You can throw a user, you can throw regular exceptions and they, they get, they, they hide the, they, they go into the logs and the details are logged. And you're going to see me screw something up at some point when I do my see this, I betcha. Um, but they get logged and then they go back as a generic user to the end user. Security best practice, right? Don't expose any more data to the end user than they really need. But if you throw a user-friendly exception, then that goes back instead of as a like 501 or something like that, it goes back as a some other HTTP status code, which the front end interprets as, oh, pop this up in a modal dialog. And so when you throw a user-friendly exception, the front end pops it up in a modal dialog. It's super convenient, quick little way to, to throw messages back to the user. Notice the localization here. This is where you do localization in the back end. If you do just an L and then index into it with a string, then that string goes into the en.json file or whatever and figures out what the value should have been. You don't have to use localization. There's only one place, and it kind of annoys me that you have to use localization. That's when you're setting up permissions. But everywhere else, it's totally optional. If you don't need localization, you don't have to use it. And it uses automapper for object mapping. So that's a quick overview. I'm going to get into the authorization a little bit more in the way security works. So I uh, put a crow's feet diagram here just so you can get used to what the words mean. First of all, users should be self-explanatory. So imagine you've got like a Bob Smith and then you can have roles such as you can have a supervisor role and a user can have multiple roles and a role can contain multiple users. It's a many to many relationship. So here's an example of editing Bob Smith and saying he could be both a supervisor and an admin or a supervisor and a minimal role or whatever. Also, there are permissions. And these are things that you define yourself in your code and you can have them mean whatever you want them to be. So this one right here is a, we're calling add permission 
for the ability to view and edit products, this is the one place where you have to use localization. So this is the string that would be shown up to the user when they are granted this permission. And so that's what a permission looks like. That's how you define it. And on app startup, that's when it gets created. And then you can use the permissions with these and uh, attributes. So this is an authorized attribute saying that you have to have the view edit products to be able to get into this app service at all. You can actually put these on controllers too. So I don't use controllers very often in ASP.NET boilerplate, but if you, uh, if I was to use a controller, I can use it there too. And lastly, a role can have permissions and a permission could be assigned to multiple roles. So here I am editing the supervisor and I have the ability to check this checkbox that says the supervisor permission can view and edit products. With me so far? Does that make sense? Cool. Okay. Good. That's, almost, that's, I don't know, that's one of the most complicated parts of ASP.NET Boilerplate to get comfortable with. But once you do, it's, uh, it's very powerful. I really like it. I talked about validation. So if you put your, if you put data annotation attributes on your data transfer objects, these get checked for you automatically. I mentioned this before, so the range. Um, but what's cool is that it's integrated from front to end, from front end to back end. So when you put in a range of zero to 999, then there's a modal dialog, which pops up. It looks really pretty to the front end and you don't have to do any extra code to get that to work. Quantity must be under 10 for products of type other. Oh, this one, actually, this one was custom. So uh, if you need custom validation, I validate, but we implement I validatable object. And then you get a, a validate method that you can override and you can write your own custom code here. So if product type is other and quantity is greater than 10 or whatever, just, you know, some weird custom business logic that you might need to, to validate. And that's all you need to do on the back end, and you get nice, nice UI on the front end. All right. Auditing. This is a really cool feature. This is awesome. Uh, if you inherit from audited aggregate root or full audited aggregate root or the interfaces, by, by the way, anytime I, anytime I give you a concrete class, they also have interfaces of our, that are available that do the same thing. But the concrete class you inherit from that, it gives you a little bit more functionality for free. There's a little bit less typing. So when I inherit from audited aggregate root, it's pulling down an extra last modification time, last modifier ID, creation time, and creator ID. No extra work. It does that with an entity framework um, filter. It does that with an entity framework filter. So there's a filter defined, and anytime you create a new thing, it puts in, it figures out who's currently logged in and fills in their creator ID. And, and the, the time is a little bit more obvious. That's so easier, but it's. I think it's just cool the way it's all integrated with the uh, um, author authorization and authentication. Same way it works for the way I mentioned it works for tenancy ID. Yeah. Okay. Also, there's soft delete functionality. So you don't have to do all hard deletes. Yeah. So if you implement I full audit aggregate root or soft delete, then it pulls down a new field for you. When you, oh yeah, when you, when you delete an object like this, then instead of hard deleting it, it will fill in an is deleted, set that to true and give you a deletion time and who deleted it. And instead of actually deleting it, it, it just plunks in those values. And whenever you retrieve product from the database, that filter is applied to never return deleted objects. So it's, it's, feels like things are being hard deleted, but they're not. You would never know that this, as a developer, that this is necessarily here unless you, you need to know that it's there. If you still want to see deleted objects, you can do that by turning off that data filter. So data filter dot disable I soft delete. And now when you're in this context, then you get all objects. You can do the same thing with tenancy, by the way, if you need to, there's a data filter for tenancy. So if you're in a multi-tenancy world, you can disable the tenancy filter and you can retrieve other tenants data if you, if you need to. So that's, uh, that's one of my favorite features. I love the auditing. That's really cool. Logging is important because like I said, anytime anything goes wrong, there's this generic user that pops up or a message that pops up and you're going to get frustrated. If you're not used to ASP and a you're going to be kind of frustrated, especially when you run into an error because it's just like this generic message and you're like, well, what's going on? Uh, so you have to know about the logs and you have to know to look into your app, ASP.NET Core, least store HTTP API host slash log slash logs.txt. And I would recommend keeping a tail tool running on that all the time. I like this tool called Beartail, but it doesn't really matter. Just, you know, you can have it open in Visual Studio Code. The thing that's kind of cool about Beartail, or I mean, I'm sure there's tons of products out there like this. This is just happens to be a free open source one, is it will do color coding. I didn't have that turned on here, but it'll do color coding for all the different log levels. And that's kind of nice. And it just is always running the tail. This is something new also that's, oh, that's so fuzzy. Sorry. But that's kind of nice about 
avp.io is they are logging, there it is, they're logging all of the queries that you run to. So it'll be a little bit easier to catch n plus one select problems if you're skimming through the logs. So I'm sure you can change the log level and, and um, make that not show up in your production, but it's kind of kind of nice. But there's a signal R client, which is enabled by default. So you could you can just um, you know send a message to everybody say, hey, I'm about to take down the app. And that would be something that would be very, very easy to do because I've already set it up and integrated it with your client front end. They have background jobs that run, you can have them run on a daily basis. And that is uh, that's pretty easy to do. Uh, they've got a whole page on documentation how to do that. They've got an event bus if you need it, implemented via RabbitMQ. I've mentioned data seeding. And C sharp, that's really nice. Modules, I've already talked about those. That's really cool. There's a facility to make SMTP easier via email and text templating. I haven't used those, so I can't talk to them, but it looks really cool. And app.io has a virtual file system, which means that if you add a resource into one of your backend objects and you set it to embedded resource, uh, I think there's another thing you can set it to that's like embedded resource, and it'll just automatically expose that to your API. So if you have like a PDF file or whatever, you can just put it in and turn it on and it, it exposes it much more easily. It's kind of nice. So those are the backend features. As far as deployment, deployment was uh, a little bit stronger in ASP.NET Boilerplate, and I would imagine it's going to get better in avp.io. If you are a Kubernetes person, I use Kubernetes on one of my projects with ASP.NET Boilerplate. Um, I had to set that all up without any guidance, just um, by, by default. But they give you a they give you a uh, like a demo site where they have set up with um, with Kubernetes and the event bus and Docker and, and all of that. They do not provide Docker images out of the box anymore. They did provide Docker images with ASP.NET Boilerplate. Uh, and now if you want to use Docker, you have to, um, it's not that hard, but it's, it's not something that's not out of the box. So just a word of warning. Oh, frankly, I didn't like their Docker files that they provided with ASP.NET Boilerplate, but I deleted them and started over anyway. They didn't use multi-stage uh, Docker files. I talked about the migrator. Actually, I already talked about the migrator, but yeah, just again, the migrator tool is really nice. I like it. From a deployment perspective. From a testing perspective, they have testing set up for you that generates an in-memory database, and then it already does all of the dependency injection for you, which is, which is, I mean, it's superb. It's really powerful because, but I don't really call, I don't consider this personally a unit test anymore. At this point, it's more of an integration test. When you're actually calling, I mean, it fires up a new in-memory database, and everything is real queries against a real database when you when you do these, but it also means they're slow. And I didn't realize this when I used ASP.NET Boilerplate on one of my projects. And after a year of creating hundreds of tests, it started getting slower and slower and like just painfully slow. And uh, I, I regretted not having written more pure unit tests. So um, on my next project, and as a lesson learned for you all, if you do go down this route, I highly recommend you use these because it's wonderful. I mean, it's a wonderful function that you get out of the box, but I would take all of their uh, in-memory tests and put them into an integration test folder and then create another folder called unit tests that doesn't spin up any databases for you. In fact, I actually submitted a pull request to them uh, to do that at some point and they um, they rejected my pull request. The jerks. <laughs> They're like, this isn't a direction we want to go. Whatever. The project. Uh, so things that you get out of here in addition to the in-memory database is, uh, first of all, it uses XUnit. So I don't know if you guys really care. I don't care personally. XUnit, NUnit, MS test, they're all pretty much just different flavors of the same thing. It uses N substitute, which is fine. I just used to mock on my previous projects or mock or however you pronounce it. Um, and so N substitute is pretty much the same thing, but they're like just different, different syntax. Um, this is a really cool thing. If you're not familiar with Shudley, any Shudley users? Yep, one, one, two. Uh, I love Shudley. It just, instead of saying assert dot r equal, and then you always forget which one should be the expected and which one should be the actual, like which order does it go in again? Um, this just allows you to write exception dot message that should be, or if you have a collection, there should only have one item. Good nice, nice clear unit test for like zero, one items in the collection as a result, right? Let's say, you know, uh, products dot should contain single item. And it both asserts that it should have a single item and returns that single item that you can then say product dot uh, uh, details or title that should be something else. It makes, it makes your assert statements really clean. I love Shirley. If you get nothing out of this project, you can use ASP.NET Boilerplate. You should totally use Shirley. So that's testing. Those are the foundational features. And we are coming to the close. It's time to do a final demo. So uh, this is how to do backend CRUD. And I know this kind of looks a little intimidating to have 10 different steps. But again, this is not 
a Ruby on Rails type of application. This is an enterprise application that's going to require a little bit of work, but I'm going to go do it and you'll see that it's not too bad. So I'm going to go into my domain and create a new. I'm not going to do the front end, by the way. If you don't mind, I'm just going to do the back end. So public can implement from uh, T. So, oh, yeah, full out of Okay, so if you, uh, any Pluralsight users? If, you, if you're a Pluralsight user, there's a really nice course from Deborah Carrada on domain-driven design. And it is, uh, it's a really nice, it's a really good useful Pluralsight course. And in there, she talks about uh, the benefits of using a GUID as a base class, as a, a primary key versus an int. In all of their examples, they use GUIDs. And the reason they do that is like, theoretically, you could have a front end object be created independently of the database and you can make a whole bunch of changes to it and build it up and, and build you know, some things on it and then send the whole thing back to the back end. That's something you can do with a GUID. And you can't really do that if you have an auto incrementing uh, int as well, because foreign keys just don't work quite as well that way. But I don't need to do that. I don't generally do that kind of thing. So I'm just going to use an int. So full audited aggregate root and let's have a name. Oops. We'll have a price. And, uh, I could do an enum or something like that, but let's just keep this real simple for now. So this is required. Obviously, it's required because it's not an question mark or a decimal question mark. Okay, uh, let's just let's do that for now. Now we need to get this to the database. So we need to add a migration. But before we can add a migration, we have to add this into the entity framework data context. All right, so I'm going to go into the entity framework core and look for the data context. Here's the data context. And there's a lot of documentation. And it says, hey, here's where you want to add your DB set. Let's go to public DB set of product with products. And there's a little note here that says, hey, do not forget that you need to map this and tell us what the state of the data is. So to do that, I'm going to go over to the uh, DB context model creating extensions, which is something I'm going to right over there. And then I can just uncomment for code because it's pretty close to what you need. Locked, there we go. To table, uh, you can have a DB table prefix. So all of the all of the tables that I'm going to create are going to be called like app products or something. Or you can turn that off if you want. I'll just leave it. Or products, which schema we're going to put it in, which leave it the default schema, which is null, empty. And then we're going to configure by convention. So calling configure by convention is what's going to pull out our data annotation attributes and use those. So I don't need to do too much else at this point. Where is my product? There it is. Sorry. So that's going to pull out my, and, and so now it'll know to use name and have it be a required string. Oh, I could do length too. I could do, uh, length of 55. Now it'll know to put in it that is a bar car 255 into the database. Awesome. I think that's all I need to do. Let's um let's run this up again. Package manager explorer. This is uh, tricky if you're not familiar with this. You have to remember to change the default project over to and the current core, I think. And I'm gonna add migration. I'm gonna call it add product. And if this works, this should pop up in my new migration. And it did. Good. And hmm. I think we put that into entity framework core. I think that was a mistake. I should have selected the default project as DB migrations. Hmm. Well, let's see if it works. <laughs> For a future reference, um, I think I think I did this wrong. I think I was supposed to select entity framework uh, DB core migrations. Yeah, maybe this works. So I'm gonna run them. Oh, first of all, let's skim over it so it's it's trying to create ABP users. That's not right. That product is correct. Hmm. This doesn't look quite right. Let's see what happens. So I'm going to run DB migrator. Control F5 it. It looks like a butcher in the initial items in the initial project. Yeah, I think you're right. I think I, I screwed this up. Let's see. Maybe I'll get lucky and it'll still work. If not. APP, APP products. Yes, it failed. Okay. Well, I'm not even going to bother deleting that. I'm just going to do it over again, and maybe we'll get lucky. 
I'll run it here in DB migrations. There we go. Yeah, and now, now users isn't in there. So I selected the correct project. I, I'm going to be lazy and just leave existing code in there. And I'm going to run the migrator and hopefully. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's much better. Now it's even giving us a warning that says, hey, you didn't specify the correct um, range for decimal. So blah, blah, blah. let's see if we have a new database table. App products. Good. Excellent. And the name is an NVAR car. Cool. Notice that it's got that deleted, uh, is deleted, last modified, created, uh, all of those things, which we didn't specify. They were in the base class when I implemented from I full audited aggregate root to mouthful. Okay, let's expose that. Let's expose that back to the application and create a new app service. This is inherent from um, word. What app service? There we go. And there's a whole bunch of generic properties that's going to ask for. First, which entity do we want this to be for? Product. We want an entity DTO. So we're going to call this product DTO. Uh, here's, a, here's a quiz for you all. Why do we use DTOs? What, what is the reason for using that? Can you say that a little louder? I couldn't hear you, Tom. Sorry, I had my mic pushed back. Um, I was saying that it creates a, an abstract so that we're not um, doing interacting directly with the entity, I believe. I could be wrong. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. And the actual benefit to you is it's a security benefit specifically. If you allow people to update products directly, and let's say you have an is deleted field or is admin field or something like that, or is, is a crazy super powerful product or something like that. Um, and you expose that, you can accidentally allow people to update properties that you didn't intend them to update. And so something like an is admin, that's a type of security attack called an overposting attack, which happens when you have a little bit too much magic going on in your, in your projects. So having your DTO, make sure that you're only exposing the things that you really meant to expose. That's important for updating and it's also useful for retrieving data. So you don't retrieve more data than you really intended to. Page and sorted for us. DTO all at once, a separate DTO. I, it used to allow me to be real lazy. I could make a product DTO and have the same product DTO be for both updating and retrieving, but it doesn't work anymore in avp.io. So I actually have to create a create. That one's a little more work. End of the world. Okay, so, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, not to interrupt, uh, when uh, the, the decorator earlier on the um, on the uh, the class, the products class, um, I noticed we got all those uh, those extra things for is create you know is created or not create uh, modified and all that um, with the last version ABP dot uh, dot net, um, I used just entity and then had to actually um, um, implement you know I had to add those implementations like I. You know what I'm saying. I'm sorry. It's getting late in the day. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. So you're, you're, you're saying that you used to have to use the interface and they didn't have a concrete class? Um, yeah, maybe I just wasn't implementing it correctly. I just was wondering uh, if my question was, is really, is, was there, is there a different implementation between um, how the last version in IO does it with um, allowing those extra fields to be uh, available? Um, well, they did change the name of the class. It used to be called, as okay. you said, entity, entity. Yeah, it used to have a different name. Now it's that. Just they call it entity or something. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, they definitely changed the name, but I don't think they changed too much beyond that. But I probably just have... implemented it incorrectly. <laughs> yeah. But if you figure, if you figure it out, uh, let me know. Um, but I can't answer that right off the top of my head. So let's see, they want your DTO to inherit from an I entity DTO. So I can do that just so that it gets the primary key. But I could do one better by in implementing the, the um, uh, concrete class. So what was it again? Um, entity detail. There we go. So that gives me an int. Do we have to do int? No, I don't have to do that. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right, okay. Now this is complaining because it wants a constructor. 
There we go. We've got a constructor. We have a repository. There's a repository pattern which we're passing into the base class. And because we implemented from CRUD app service, then we're getting that create, read, update, delete, and get all methods for free. Now, we need to put in some properties into our product DTO and our create product DTO. So I'm just going to copy. Oh, by the way, these shouldn't really be here. They should probably be in um, contracts, I think. Yeah, if you're used to ASP.NET boilerplate, you'll notice there's a lot more folders. Necessarily know if that's a good thing or not. It used to be the case that having more projects actually built slower, but I don't, that was a long time ago. Depends on what they are. Yeah. Products, and let's just copy over name, quantity, price on the that's being retrieved and copy over that data annotation attributes here. And this is important. Why? Because that's what val that's what pulls down the validation. So you want your data annotation attributes on your create DTO so that it knows to perform validation when it's um, when API methods are calling in from the web. So I think I can just compile this now. Oh, 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 I'll tell you what, yeah, it's not gonna work, but let's watch it not work. Uh, so I think there's one more thing I need to do. I'm going to control F5, and we are going to see some swagger. I think it should just work here. It should actually be a product. Here we go. There's, our, there's all of our, our code methods. That's cool, right? But I think if I go and create one now, it's going to fail. Let's see. Oh, wait, not put. It's post. Try it out. Let's call this a siren of shame. Mm -hmm. This used to be a thing. I haven't made a sale of Siren Shame in like over a year. I think the, um, the coronavirus, people aren't working in the same environments anymore. And so they don't have a need for a siren that goes wah, 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 when everyone breaks the build. You just know if you broke the build, isn't it? <laughs> um, okay, let's try to execute that. And we got a 500 error. Okay. And so we want to know what that 500 error is. So let's look in, like I said, you have to look in log for net, uh, not log for net, in the, in the log. -in. Post a bunch of logs, and here's our logs.txt. And oh, that's a long stack trace. Okay, so it's complaining about mapping. It's saying, I don't know how to do this um, mapping. I don't know how to turn a product, create product DTO into a product. I just I don't know what you're talking about. So there are a couple different ways to fix this. So using auto mapper or object, uh, yeah, auto mapper you could create a profile and it will just automatically pick it up. If you create a new class called a profile, you can define how the mapping works. Or there is, if you are feeling a little bit lazy, there's a common class for all of your, uh, for all of your mapping. Auto map a profile. Oh, <laughs> sibling, it was right here. So yeah, so you can also put it here. And so I want to say, I want to create a map that it is okay for you to try to create product DTO into a product. And that is all you need to do to enable that to happen. It's just saying it is okay for you to map these two things to each other. If you need to, of course, you can do a lot of customization for the you know, four members and say, this is how to map this particular item and this is how to map this other item. While that and I suspect this will work now. Oh, 500. Okay. Oh, I know. I bet you it worked. And then I tried to return it back from a product DTO back in, from product back into a product DTO. Yeah. Okay. So I need to make a second mapping now, which is turning this product, once it's been complete, successfully inserted into the database, um, I need to turn it back into, it's okay to turn it back into a product DTO. All right. I also sell mugs on the Siren Shame website, which say, break the build, feel the shame. So let's make a mug. I'm really not trying to sell to you, I don't care. It's just, it was a hobby I did for a while. Okay, 200, excellent. Okay, so now that that was successfully inserted, I think we ought to be able to retrieve them all and get products. Yeah, let's try it out. Execute and only one of them succeeded. Oh, because it was transactional, right? Okay, you, got to, you just got to see the benefits of, of a transaction. So that first one, I thought it was going to successfully insert, and I was going to have two rows in there, but there was only one because it was a transaction. It rolled back the transaction. So that's kind of cool. So there's only one. It's the mug, and you can see how, how it supports pagination by default because the JSON here has a total count, and 
that makes it easier to do pagination. And it's only returning however many I specified up here in the skip max results and sorting. Okay, how am I, how am I doing on time? Um, I can do more of this demo if you want to see more security stuff, or we could call it a night. Yeah, I mean, we're usually good until eight. Uh, so probably wrap, wrapping up here in a little bit, but we have got a little bit more time. Uh, okay. I'd love to see some more. Uh, I, I do have one question, and I think you might have touched on it, but I'm still trying to figure out uh, the you know, having you need two DTOs for your one uh, you know uh, concrete class, the concrete entity, I guess. So you need two DTOs for one entity, and what what's the reason for having to create DTO? Well, because you might want to expose different values uh, when you're reading than when you're writing. So, for example, like imagine in my when I return it, I would actually like to show you who who created it and when they created it, and who modified it, and when they modified it. But I don't want to expose that when I'm creating one of these things. So let's let's do that right now. So it's a public, actually, I have to look it up. I go to product, full audit at root. Um, it's not deleted, so I don't care about that. The audited aggregate root. Sure, let's do last modification time. Actually, let's do create. Let's do the created date. So I get one of these, one of these, and in my product DTO, it makes sense to expose that in the product DTO, but not the create product DTO. So actually, I think all I need to do is just recompile. And when I run the retrieving, oh, there it is. We've got the creation time and the clear ID. Pretty cool, right? That was easy. That's, that's uh, very cool. I, I, I would I, I would love to show you, it's you know it's a little more time than I think we have, but I would love to show you actually more like how to how to retrieve the creator's username or how to retrieve the creator's uh, display name or whatever, all that kind of stuff. But that's a little bit beyond what we have the time for, but it's not that hard. And if you're on a bad network or your customers run a bad network, you can use DTO to reduce your uh, you know total payload size and everything. Oh, thank you, Zach. That is a really good point. It is really easy when you're exposing your entities to accidentally expose the, you know, if you've got a sale, to accidentally expose the sale and the product and the product and, and the um, customer and the customer's company. And, you know, you can accidentally expose all this extra stuff that it just um, expands out if you're not careful. And I've seen it do that where when you're auto-generating your TypeScript proxies, I've had coworkers who have exposed the entity rather than the entity DTO. And yet in that, um, the NSWAG uh, code generation object for a sale ends up being gigantic and it exposes all these extra objects you didn't mean to. Thanks for reminding me about that, Zach. Good call. So I kind of kind of segueing from that one, like, um, you know, from a DDD perspective, what's the richest aggregate that you've done in terms of like number of like maybe sub objects or like layers deep? And I don't do sub objects, and I don't yeah. do layers deep. I I will always make things flat. I okay. Denorm I'll denormalize all my DTOs. Okay. You don't have to do it that way, but I just feel that it's it's cleaner and I, I have smaller. I have smaller methods. I'm more chatty, and I flatten things when necessary. Okay. I used to have I used to have um, more much more complicated APIs that would return an object and a subobject and you know all this stuff and you'd make one call and it would get absolutely everything. But I don't think that's how we're supposed to architect things these days anymore. We're supposed to go for much more smaller granular method calls. But it's better for caching, for instance. Uh, let's do permissions if we've got yeah. Let's do permissions real quick. So I'm going to. It's such an important part of this to, to understand. So in my products app service, say this is um, required, no, requires permission, no, uh, authorize, authorize, and it's got these are three permissions. Dot, and we'll just call this, uh, you know, products. So this is uh, const string. They wanted me to use this. I wanted to follow their pattern. Public const string group name is your three dot. That's not good enough. We all we have done now is we've said, hey, you have to have this permission to be able to get into this app service, but we've never defined the permission. Let's define the permission. And for that, we go into the permission definition provider. We call add permission. Products. And here's one of those few places where you have to use localization. So I'll call this permission call products. I'm going to jump over to the end.js. And oops, 
pn.json. Oops, permissions colon call products. Ability create products. That's what's going to show up in the UI. So, uh, and you know, keep in mind, this is just, you can find these permissions however you want. You can make them however granular you want. You can make one just for create. You can make one for reading and make one for um, cut, cutting, <laughs> creating, updating, deleting. You can make one separately for deleting. Uh, I needed to do this for my customers, just depending on each entity. Sometimes they have a role that they can only view stuff. So to find whatever you need. There is a final permission here that is optional that I highly recommend that I wish it, I had not made it optional because it's, it's easy to get wrong and it's worth thinking about. And that is, especially if you're using multi-tenancy. Um, and the default value is kind of long too. So this last parameter, if you're doing multi-tenancy is saying, should this be available only to the host, which is like the site which owns all of the other sites, but doesn't necessarily, it's like the, the corporate organization that owns all of the bookstores, but not any one of the, one of the bookstores individually. So you almost never say host. That's a small kind of rare thing to go. And maybe they do reporting and, and they create new bookstores when, when bookstores get created. But generally, if you're doing multi-tenancy, the most common thing you want to select here is tenant. I'm lazy. I'll go ahead and leave it be both, but it's just something to, to think about. So now we've defined our permission. I think that's all I need to do. If I compile this and I try to retrieve products again, I should get a 40, uh, 401. 404. I feel like that's wrong. It should be a 401, not a 404, but whatever. I got a 404. I got an error anyway. And this, by the way, this is, this is, there's lots of like little things that you can nitpick ASP net boilerplate or ABP.io about. And the, like I have a coworker that always complains heavily that they use the wrong HTTP status codes. And it's like, eh, yeah, okay. I guess they didn't use the right status code. Whatever. Who cares? Uh, for everything you're getting, I guess. Okay. So that, so that didn't work. Uh, so we need to be able to do that and to, to get it. I think the reason is because the currently logged in user does not have that permission. Remember I said there's a relationship between the currently logged in user, the roles they belong to and the role and the permissions that that role has. Well, the currently logged in user called admin belongs to a role called admin. I'm sorry, that's a little confusing, same name twice, but the role admin does not have that new permission that we just created. So we could add a migration fold or we could go in and it is ability to create, read, and update and delete products. So if I add that permission to the role admin and I save that, then when I go back out here and run this, now we should get a successful 200. Yay, and we did. And there's our mug again. So there is permissions, and that just about closes out my presentation. It certainly closes out the demo. That's a really nice interface that they give you to configure. That's... I, I like it. I, I will say that I liked the ASP.NET boilerplate, the old one they had about a year ago, because they used all um, material, Angular, at least the Angular one had all Angular material. And I, I just think material is beautiful. I love the material UI. Um, I don't know. Is that I just, Bootstrap now? Is that... They use Bootstrap and some custom thing, I think. Some some company that sells themes gave them discount or made it free or something. Right? But yes, it is primarily Bootstrap. Um, so this is the steps that I just went through. I added an entity. I created the data database context. I added the database context model creating extensions. And if you are, if you don't like the idea of creating it by hand for every single entity, you didn't used to have to do this step when you were in ASP.NET Boilerplate. You used to do it with Ruby or Reflection. I wrote this little gist, which uses Reflection, and you can plug that in instead if you want. Um, it makes me log in. It's weird. Are you kidding me? I just want to look at the gist. All right, I'm not going to do too much job anyway. But if you you go to this, it ought to allow you to see this code. You can plug in if you want. Um, you then add a migration. You can see the data. I didn't show that. Run that data mi migrator project or update database. It gives you the database updates into the database. Uh, create that app service at the DTOs. Define the auto map or mappings. Register and then register the permissions. And then you run the app in here. So you swag and you rejoice. Yay! It's awesome. If there was time, I would love to show you how in Angular to regenerate the proxies, but that's very Angular specific. And only three of you raised your hand when I said Angular. So just know that that's a thing and it's cool. It's a lot easier in MVC. It's also a lot easier in Blazor. You don't even have to worry about regenerating proxies. But if you were to do it in Angular, yeah, you would regenerate the proxies, you would add a module, you update the routing, you update the nav, and then you can just like duplicate their existing sample projects. This used to be a little bit easier in ASP and a boilerplate because they gave you all of the code in the front end project for like users' roles and permissions, which was which was handy because you just copy that existing folder and use their folder their pattern. But they have 
move that into the framework code that comes with uh, comes with out of NuGet or um, uh, no, Node. Uh, so, yeah. Sorry, it's getting late. Yeah. Thank you, NPM. And so, yeah, so that gives them the benefit of being able to ship updates and bug fixes and stuff like that, because there were bugs that you'd find as you were doing all of that. Um, so that's like, they've moved a little bit away from code generation and more towards the platform in abp.io. And so the consequences you have to, you can't just copy their existing code as easily. Fix the fields to have UI. And there you go. So that's, that's me. Sorry, say it again. Again. In terms of performing, what, what is very for your point of view, Blazor or Angular? If you're asking me if I were to start a new project today? No, 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 the performance. Oh, from a performance perspective? Oh, Angular. Angular is faster. Yes, for final user, what, what do you like? What do you think is better for final user, Angular or, or Blazor? Blazor looks like oh, too heavy. For a final user. I don't... In terms of loading times and that kind of stuff. I mean, loading times are probably going to be better with, with Angular. In terms of convenience for the developer, I mean, C Sharp is just the best language that's ever been created. <laughs> Plus, if you use WebAssembly, I prefer Angular over ASP.NET MVC personally. Uh, um, just, uh, I don't know, just easier to enable rich functionality on the client side, in, in my opinion. Uh, you just kind of have to. You have to fight it a little bit more with uh, Razor in my mind, but that's of course you know there's personal um, yeah. feel, and of course you know it depends on how good you know each one too. You know, pretty much if you know any one of these frameworks really well, you can make anything happen. But uh, you know, I think Angular is pretty awesome in the front end. If you um, if you want me to come back at some point, I actually have a presentation on this very topic uh, called uh, Blazor WebAssembly versus Angular. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a whole I have a whole presentation Thank on you. that Thank very you. topic. Thank you for your answer. Yeah. You bet. Um, for for the if you are a developer, which is faster to develop to get faster to more modules and more functionalities and more business rules? You think it's Blazor or is Angular? I would think Blazor. Blazor is faster. I mean, if you, especially if you're already in the .NET ecosystem, right? I don't know. These are all opinions, and I'm sure everyone's going to have a different um, answer depending on who you ask. So I should probably move along real quick before someone <laughs> tells me. <I'm> wrong. <laughs> um, so let me give some final thoughts. Uh, are you all familiar with Parkinson's law of triviality? No? So mm -hmm. that is when members of an organization give disproportionate weight to trivial issues. So it's also known as bike shedding or missing forest for the trees. And that example of having the wrong HTTP status codes, I think is, is a great example of Parkinson's law of triviality. It's like, if you're if you're so focused on the indenting being wrong, like, oh, you know, why didn't they, you know, why did they use two spaces instead of four spaces? Or, you know, why didn't they, um, you know, put new lines up, you know, stuff like that. It, it's really easy to get bogged down with those kinds of things when you're going with a framework like abp.io. And so I think it's really just, it's important to step back when you're starting to get off track. It's like, just remember everything that you're getting with this. You're getting localization, pagination, sorting, UI helpers, and that cool data table and the proxy generation and the login authentication authorization piece. That, that piece of it is just a huge time saver. If you're using multi-tenancy, then that is, that's like a month's worth of dev work right there, just taken away from you. Um, as far as testing that in-memory database, it's just more stuff you don't have to set up. It's wonderful. The database migrator is a real nice convenience, good for security. Talk about authorization, the DDD base classes, and the auto CRUD that you're getting, the server-side validation, and the data annotations, and the custom validator, all part of the validation story. The user-friendly exception that just pops up a nice modal dialog. The auto mapper being set up for you. The modules, dependency injection, auditing, soft delete. Repository pattern, transactions, logging, data seeding, signal error, background jobs, virtual file system, all of that is a huge amount of functionality. It's a very powerful platform. So I hope uh, you'll give it a shot, maybe uh, consider it for your next project. Great way to be a superhero. And I hope you've enjoyed. My name is Lee Richardson. I am on uh, uh, Twitter at L. Pritchall and YouTube at youtube.com slash Lee 200. I blog at LeeRichardson.com. I work in an awesome company called Inferno Red. They're always looking for great talent. If you are, uh, if you're interested, shoot me a note. So that's, that's all I got. Thank you, Lee. That was awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thanks a lot. Looks awesome. Good. Any yep. last questions? Uh, does it use all the native, like, uh, you know, release optimization kind of stuff, depending on what you picked as the, like, the front end? Um, if you compile it in release mode, 
it does the default settings. Can you give me an example? So like if I have, uh, and I'm assuming that they're keeping up with like the latest versions of release versions of like, if I picked Angular for the front end, it would have the latest version of that and Angular 10. It is, it's just know, like the, if you were to do, yeah. yeah, it's just like if you were to use ng, ng new, not ng generate, ng new, um, it would give you that exact site basically. Okay, and then it, you know when, it, when I'm done and then I'm ready to release that package that it generates at the end is the same as I would get from if I just had an Angular project. Yeah, it is, it is pretty much. Oh, you know, I should have mentioned this in the presentation. Sorry, this is my first time giving this presentation to a live audience. So I might've been a bit rough around the edges, but um, one thing that's worth knowing about is that because and it's a, actually, it's kind of an important point because you're, when you take a dependency on an ASP.NET Boilerplate, when you choose that for your project, it takes its dependency on the version of .NET, meaning that when .NET releases a new version, like when, they, when .NET 5 came out, you're, there's about a two week period when they have not updated their code for .NET 5, during which you cannot get .NET 5. So if you're an early adopter and you want .NET 5 features like today, as soon as it releases, you're not going to get that. You're going to have to wait for them to, to update it. It's a very active community. So it, it happens pretty quickly. It's within generally like a couple of weeks of when the .NET or whatever downstream dependency you, you are depending on comes out. But it is, it's an issue potentially. How good are they with the keeping up with the Angular releases? Same. It's within, within weeks. Oh, they're, they're really? They're very good. Awesome. Yeah. Do a really good job. And actually when .NET 3 came out, they they had same day support for, .NET Core 3 came out, they had same day support for that, which was cool. I think that was because they were in, they were yeah. in the, um, <laughs> the .NET, yeah, .NET Conf, so they had to. So how's the uh, container development support? So say I want a container with hot reloading <laughs> on a Docker container. Um, basically the tooling you... so if i'm in vs code mm -hmm. and i want to have a launch configuration that splits off my angular front end into one container and mm -hmm. my asp host on the other in another container yep and then have it hot reload as i'm saving files and making changes and stuff is that supported i don't see why it wouldn't be i i feel like that's the kind of thing that should just work out of the box I've Dockerized my components, but I've not done the with a hot reload, so I can't answer that from personal experience. I'm assuming it is, just because it's I, you know. I'm using an old, I'm using an old a, uh, an older version of ABP and uh, um, React front end, and uh, usually when I'm developing, I've got the ABP running over here and the other. I think it. I think a hot reloads, I can't, I, but I'm not using Docker containers. So I can't, I can't speak to that. Yeah. I mean, it definitely does hot reloading for the, for the Angular when you run it as um, ng serve, but, but doing it through the Docker container, I, I just don't know the answer for sure. Good question. All right. Well, I guess, I guess that's it. So thanks again. Fantastic. Thank you very much again, Lee. Uh, guys, uh, next month we'll be back with uh, Jesse Liberty presenting on Get Git. 90 minutes, and he's going to show you Git with uh, the basics and also the advanced stuff you might not use uh, day to day, including you know interactive debugging and um, UIs for Git, including Git Desktop and being able to use Git in um, Visual Studio. Uh, and so, if you need to sharpen your skills with Git, come check it out next month.